in your book or in the photocopies. <laughs> and the section says, <clears throat> the vegan says, let us pray for the Lord, cover master. All right, so just to review, we're at the, we're at the end now of the protocol media service, the service of preparation. So we went through the keros of the clergy do, uh, the, the right of preparation for the clergy. We went through the vesting prayers <laughs> as they get vested. Now we're going through this other preparatory service that's usually taking place now during orthros. Uh, this is the end that we're coming to the end of that service. So we've already, we saw how we put, we put the lamb on the patent here. We put the crumbs representing the names that we commemorated. And now we're going to, we're covering it to prepare it for liturgy. So at this point, usually we at, uh, we cover it uh, after we go out and sense for the uh, Theotokos and the Mother of Elijah, the song of Magnifying Song. And then if the deacon's there, he goes out and senses the church. When he comes back in, that's when we usually do this. So Father Micah is going to be our like band on white. Why, why do you cover them? So that's what we're going to read. It. He, uh, <clears throat> all right, so it says, Let us pray to the Lord, Mother Mass. Priest senses the second veil. All right, so we already put this in. Remember, this is a, this represents the star that the wise men followed, it's, but it's got a practical purpose too. We already put on the first cover. So the lamb is inside there, we've covered it. And now we're gonna cover the chalice. So the priest sen senses the second veil and covers the chalice with it. In other words, someone else, usually the deacon is holding the censer. Father Micah uh, would take it, would wave it over the censer. And then he's gonna put it on the chalice saying, your virtue, O Christ, has covered the heavens and the earth is full of your praise. Deacon, let us pray to the Lord, shelter master. The priest senses the third veil, the ayer, and covers both the pat and the chalice with it, saying, Shelter us in the shelter of your wings. Drive away from us every enemy and adversary. Bring peace to our lives. Lord, have mercy on us and on your world and save our souls, for you are good and the lover of mankind. All right, the celebrant covers the gifts which are being offered with the sacred covers. Similarly, the power of God incarnate was covered at first, until the time of his miracles. The gifts remain covered from this moment up to the recitation of the creed. This covering reminds us of the fact that Jesus was not known at all from the beginning, and that even though he became incarnate, he did not come forth from the hiddenness of his divinity and his providence. He is known only to the extent that he reveals himself. <laughs> all right, so if you remember, uh, you know, Jesus' ministry, uh, even his own disciples really don't understand who he is until at least halfway through the gospel. And when he does perform miracles, he usually tells the people, don't tell anybody. Now, they don't always follow that, but he tells them, don't, don't tell anybody. So he's trying to keep hidden his identity at the beginning of his ministry. Can you explain when you shake the eye what you're doing in the prayers? So really, practically, it was to keep the flies away. Uh, that was before screens, yeah. yeah, so nothing would intrude into the holy, gifts. exactly. Yeah, you wouldn't want a fly to go into the wine or something like yeah. that. Sometimes in the, the Russian church, too, you know, the the things the altar boys carry around and have the kind of the circle. The the yeah. So sometimes in the Russian church, you'll see them actually oh, the yeah. gifts, and that that's that was the same purpose to keep the flies off. And that was also uh, sometimes you'll see in in pictures of like uh, pharaohs or ancient Roman emperors, mm -hmm. they would fan them. Yeah. And it wasn't so much to like keep them cool, but no, to, to keep, keep the, 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 the skin and, and everything away. Even when you're in front of us at the altar and now we're holding it and yeah. shaking it, that's the same. Yeah, that's the, yeah, so there are a few there's the, uh, I can't remember what the Samoan. Yeah, so, so, so it's, it's a lot of these practical things yeah. over a year, over the years, people will <laughs> apply like symbolic meaning to them. Yeah. Um, and it's 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 interesting because uh, in different places they'll pack a different symbolic meaning to it. Mm -hmm. Um so so like you, you see the same thing with these kind of like the church fathers when they write about the liturgy, 
And what St. Nicholas of Vasquez says is different from what St. Yeramano says as far as its symbolic meaning sometimes. Um, so, so with the shake in that year at the creed, uh, the two that I've heard, one is it represents the curtain yes. uh, and it's brought down when Christ is crucified, right? Because it was rent as thunder. Yeah. Um, and the, the other one is it, it represents uh, the grace of the Holy Spirit blowing. That's, that's the, the one we were talking about. Yeah, so I, I, I think I think that uh, depending <laughs> on what you're taught is how you shake it. The breath so, of God. So yeah. some, some priests will like shake it like it's an earthquake and some will like, like, like you know, gently like, like it's the blowing spirit, the, yeah. the wind. Uh, those are the two that I Is it appropriate? You tell me if it's not going to be covered later. Why it's on your the face of a priest when you fall asleep? Yeah. As a, I they put know. an air. Yeah. The priest holds a gospel book when, he, when he's passed away, and they put an air over his face when they bury him. I would guess it's a, like a veil. You know, like yeah. Moses covered his face with a veil because he spoke face to face with God, and uh, the people of Israel couldn't look upon him, so he covered his face with a veil. This would be a veil covering the glory of the Lord. That's so that's what that's why we that, that's that's why we do it at the precincts by liturgy. Yeah, because we were doing the entrance. It's actually with the consecrated body and blood, so we cover, cover our right. faces. Yeah. And the skin. All right. Uh, okay. For the first thirty years of his earthly life, Christ remained in obscurity. And when later they said to him, show yourself to the world, Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. For Christ's time is the time of his sacrifice. So, in other words, what he's saying is, we've prepared the gifts, he's been born in Bethlehem, but we haven't gotten to the part of the service yet where he's going to be sacrificed. So that's why it's still covered, it's hidden, just like it, he was hidden until he began his ministry. God's virtue, which has covered the heavens, is his love for mankind. And the greatest proof of this love are the gifts offered to us by baptism and the Eucharist. What can compare with these great gifts? That humans should become gods and sons of God. That human nature should be honored with God's honor. That our clay should be raised to such a height of glory as to be equal in honor with the divine nature, equal to God. This is God's virtue, which has covered the heavens. As the celebrant covers the precious gifts, he says these prophetic words, which were fulfilled when Christ became man. And he asked for the Lord's protection and mercy for the whole world. So you see, uh, your virtue of Christ has covered the heavens and the earth is full of your praise is a quote from Habakkuk 3.3. 3. All right. And next, so the next action, the deacon says, bless, master. The priest takes the censer from the deacon and senses the holy prophecies, the, the area where this has been laid out, saying three times, blessed is our God who has been thus well pleased, glory to you. Blessed is our God who has been thus well pleased. The deacon concludes each time, always now and ever unto the ages of ages, amen. I have a question here. Yeah. But when it says shelter us in the shelter of your wings. Yeah. It was prophesied that there would be healing in the wings of Christ. Mm. And I've been told back in my Protestant days that when the uh, woman with the issue of blood, the correct pronunciation is not him, it's fringe. She touched the fringe of his garment. Yeah, because indicating the, the Jewish the Jewish prayer shawl that he wore right. that had fringe that represented the people. You guys wear a healing one with fringe represents us, and that's put over our heads at confession. Mm -hmm. So we're in the shadow of the wings. They call those the wings. Is that the same? Is that fringe around it representing us? And we're under the shadow of his wings to represent healing in this case, as well as confession. Mm -hmm. well, what do you think about that? And have you heard it be. before that the, the when you're in the shadow of the wings of the I put your helium yeah. and you're receiving helium. Is that something you've heard of before? I, I haven't. I haven't either. Yeah. But it, I mean, it sounds plausible. Because it was prophesied that there would be healing in his wings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. this is a quote from Psalm 16 Shelters in the shelter of your wings, drive away from the enemy and adversary. Hmm. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good one. Because they always have a fringe on, don't they? There? Mm, no, no, no. 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 Yeah. 
Yeah, not always. It's like, uh, what do they say when the flag has a fringe on it? Have you ever heard of these conspiracy uh, theories? Uh, <laughs> so they, if, sometimes there are some American flags that have fringe on them, and they say that it represents like a military tribunal. Honorable enrichment is yeah. what it means. Oh, yeah. That's what it says. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it's something like that you're under a court mark the law or something like that. There, there are people who are like tax evaders have tried to make this like case. Like, mm -hmm. well, I was trying with a flag that had a fringe <laughs> on it and put up this airplane under military law or something. Mm -hmm. Tracy, you'll learn a lot of different things in this. Yeah, I agree with that one. <laughs> <laughs> is that a reference to healing the, under the shelter of your wings? Is that... So the, the, the verse that you're talking about is in uh, Malachi. It's reference to the uh, <clears throat> son of righteousness, S-U-N of righteousness. You have healing in your wings. Uh, and there's some debate on whether that's the, the proper translation. Uh, Some say that it should have been, it's more likely rays. Uh, oh, the rays of the, the sun of righteousness. Uh, but some people say wing. But anyway. All right, the blessing of God and the blessing of man. <laughs> the book of Genesis says that God blessed creation, man, and time. Having received God's blessing, man should have repaid the gift by glorifying his holy name. But sin not only prevented him glorifying his creator, it also turned God's blessing into a curse. Once again, however, the loving father did not abandon his creature, but sent into the world his blessing, Christ. He, through the sickness of disobedience, brought in the curse. But you, Virgin Theotokos, have caused blessing to flower for the world. Christ, the blessing of the father, has set us free from the curse, becoming a curse for us. St. John Chrysostom says, just as Christ humbled himself in order to exalt you and died in order to make you immortal, so he became a curse in order to fill you with his blessing. As the divine liturgy, we receive Christ, the fullness of every blessing, and give thanks to the giver by blessing. So the, the Greek word for blessing is evlogia, uh, evlogo, evlogia. Literally, evlogo means to say a good word. Is, is literally the root to say a good word to speak a good word so when it, when it talk, uh, talks about us blessing god it means to say a good word about god is to praise his name uh, etc when it's talking about god blessing us it has you know the different meaning but you can imagine it as god speaking into existence good things for us but uh Usually we don't think of it as words. What we offer as men, because it sounds strange in, in, in Greek, it doesn't, but in English it sounds strange to say that I bless God, I bless God, right? But it just means mm -hmm. to say a good word. It's also confusing with with English because we've actually used the word blessing or bless to translate two very different Greek words. So there's makarios, mm -hmm. uh so like in the Beatitudes, blessed is is not Evlogia, it's Makari, um, which has a different, different meaning. What is it? What is the different meaning? Uh, so Makarios uh, is, is kind of uh, uh, being in a, a state of blessedness or sanctity, holiness. Um, joy. It's joy. Big, it's yeah. like big holiness and big joy. Yeah, so, so uh, uh, Makar that. actually comes from Homeric Greek, and it was... Uh, Attributed to the the state that the gods would get in when they drank the ambrosia, okay. uh, so it was drinking this heavenly drink would make them blessed, which is kind of interesting when we think of the church participating in the cup and sharing in the blessedness of God. Oh, swift and water yeah. 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 It usually leaks usually just on the other side of this wall. But well, what's up there? A bathroom? No, it's the rain. He came last, he, came, he was here today looking for leaks. No, 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 that's really good point. I'm sorry, no, no, I just kept no. hearing something. I didn't know what it was. 
So how do those how do those words relate to blessing? His blessing. So well, let's see. It says here, uh, the divine energy we will receive Christ, the fullness of every blessing. All of these blessings are Evlogia, and give thanks to the giver by blessing. But the blessing that we celebrate is a new gift of God. For he who blesses God, in other words, praises God, gains something himself, making himself more glorious without giving anything to him. When God blesses, however, he makes us more glorious. So in both cases, the gain is ours. So whether God blesses us, or whether we sing his praises, in both cases, the, the gain is ours. <clears throat> Christ desires that our life should be one continuous liturgy, so that he can offer us his blessings. Hence, let us take care to live in such a way, and so show such zeal for virtue, that those who see us will offer up hymns of blessing to God our Master. Since he is good and loves mankind, he wants to be glorified by us, not because he is adding something to his glory, since he lacks nothing, but so that we may give him opportunities to favor us with yet more of his love. So by us, he who blesses is blessed in return by God. So by us offering up hymns and praises to God, glorifying his name through our actions, such that others praise God and glorify God because of what they see us doing, this re re results in us being blessed and glorified by God. We begin every service and sacrament by blessing God. When we say, blessed is our God, always, now, and ever. Because, because it is through them that we receive his grace. In other words, through the services and sacraments. We receive his grace even more at the divine liturgy, since we receive Christ himself, the blessing of God the Father. It is this blessing addressed to God that the Apostle Paul is indicating when he calls the cup of the Eucharist the cup of blessing. Through her ministry and the mystery of the incarnation of the Word, our Lady and the Mother of God became the instrument whereby the Holy Trinity was glorified. In you, Immaculate One, the mystery of the Trinity is hymned and glorified. In a similar way, the celebrant becomes the instrument whereby the threefold Son of the Godhead is glorified through his ministry and the mystery of the Eucharistic incarnation of the Word. He senses three times. And each time blesses the name of God the Father, who is well pleased to bestow his benefactions on man through the Son in the Holy Spirit. Even before the liturgy begins, man experiences the love of God and spontaneously blesses and glorifies him. And when the celebration of the mystery begins, man enters into the blessed kingdom of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The deacon takes the censer uh, back from the priest and says, for the holy and sacred offering of the precious gifts, let us pray to the Lord. With a contrite heart, the priest says the prayer of the offering, or sometimes it's called in the Old English, the oblation. God, our God, who sent forth the heavenly bread, the food of the whole world, our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, is our Savior and Redeemer and Benefactor, to bless and sanctify us. Bless this offering and receive it on your altar above the heavens. In your goodness and love for mankind, remember those who have offered it and those for whom they have offered it. So this is a prayer I talk about sometimes, why it's such a blessing for us to offer the prosper. Uh, and why, like in Greece and in Russia, they, they actually kind of fight, like uh, each each family, each woman, like they want the priest to use their prosper. Because why? Because there's a special blessing here. Hey, other... I, I text it. Okay. <clears throat> in your goodness and love for mankind, remember those who have offered it, this bread that we're now, that we're now prepared, and those for whom they have offered it. In other words, the names that they submitted, along with the post that we talked about last time. So our names are also referred to at this point? Yeah, yeah. so the, whoever, you know, each family would bring their own post for, and they would, along with the, the bread, they would have a list of names of their family and their friends and so on. And whichever one was selected, uh, it's this is a special prayer to remember the, that person who prepared the bread and made that offering. <laughs> remember them who made it and the names that they submitted with them, those for whom they offered it. There, there's a, there's a, in the early church, it was common for not everybody, but everybody of means would bring bread. And so there would be, uh, there was a place called the Skevo Pilatin, which was actually outside of the church. 
And that's where everyone would bring their bread and wine and they would select the best that would be offered. But all the loaves that were, were left, and if you think about uh, a church like Aia Sophia, where you know 15,000 people are coming, you know, even if just a small percentage of them brings a loaf or if they're well off, they bring five loaves. Um, so they said that, uh, uh, and then there was a portico around. So all the poor would be able to receive a loaf of bread. So there was the saying that on, on the Lord's Day in Constantinople, nobody ever went hungry. That's cool. Mm -hmm. So there's that kind of diaconia side of the food. And that's why it's so that scale of Malachia that he's talking about, which literally means the place where the vessels are guarded uh, was outside the church. That's where the bread was, was put. <laughs> and originally all of this was taking place there this preparation was taking place there. And then the procession, the great entrance, was actually an entrance because the bread would actually be brought from outside into the church. But over time, especially, you know, once, uh, well, it, you know, for various historical reasons, those things got moved inside the church <laughs> to the safety of the altar. So the scale of Blackman and the uh, prophecies uh, got moved inside the altar. <laughs> So that's what you know. We saw when we went to look inside the chapel. Off to the left is uh, the prothesis. On the other side is the scale of the which just means that's where we keep all the vessels. Because mm -hmm. that's that's the gospel was kept outside too, wasn't it? Wouldn't it process mm -hmm. from outside? Yeah, uh, the small the small, small, yeah, the small, yeah, small entrance. Yeah. They would gather outside of the church, and they would all enter into the church. So usually, the the bishop would have the gospel. And that's what, in a sense, opened the doors for yeah. people to enter into. I mean, can you remember, too, that the Gospels, were, especially in the early church, to have it to any copy of the Gospel was expensive. extremely expensive. So probably it was something that the bishop guarded. I mean, we know that from the persecutions, too, that the bishop guarded the scriptures. And it was that was one of the things that was asked of them during the persecution is turn over the scriptures to be burned. And they were often killed because they refused to do that. <laughs> so you can imagine probably they were guarding it in their home or with them and then bringing it into the church for the service. <clears throat> right, remember those who have offered it and those for whom they have offered it. And as we celebrate your divine mysteries, keep us without condemnation. For sanctified and glorified is your all honored and majestic name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now endeavor unto ages and ages. Amen. The priest then gives the dismissal. The dismissal is the kind of familiar ending for all of our services, you know, what do we say? Uh, through the uh, through the most holy theologos, through the life giving and precious cross, through the honorable uh, Baptist, the foreigner, John, etc. <laughs> From the Father, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit. Christ is the heavenly bread, the bread of eternal life. The fact that communion and the bread of life bears fruit in the form of eternal life is clear proof that the bread is from heaven. That is from God the Father. Christ has assured us, my Father gave me the true bread from heaven. Symbolic of the Heavenly Father's ascent to the offering of his Son is the veil, which the celebrant puts over the gifts, which is called the ayer. This ascent is revealed also by Christ's words to Pilate. <clears throat> he would have no power over me if it had not been given you from above. The words given from above signify the Father's ascent to the passion of the Son. And at the same time, signify that the Son voluntarily accepts his sacrifice on the cross. Through the service of preparation, uh, the Church is preparing us for the mystery of Trinitarian theurgy, the triune action of God. Christ is offered, the Father gives his ascent, and the All Holy Spirit, symbolized by the incense, prepares for the entry of the Great King. Everything takes place from the Father through the Son. In the Holy Spirit. The deacon senses the holy prophecies, then he ascends in the holy altar all around in the form of a cross, and the sanctuary, and the people sang in a low voice the following tropae, the following hymns. With your body, O Christ, you are in the tomb, with your soul in hell as God, in paradise with the thief, and on the throne of the Father and the Spirit, filling all things yet yourself uncircumscribed. In other words, he can't be contained anywhere. He was in the tomb while he was also uh, in Hades as God uh, and also in paradise with the thief and on the throne. 
Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. And how life giving has your tomb become, O Christ, truly lovelier than paradise and more radiant than any royal bridal chamber, the source of our resurrection. Both now and ever, unto ages of ages, O man, rejoice, sanctify, divine tabernacle of the Most High. For through you, O Theotokos, joy was given to those who cry, Bless are you among women, O all immaculate lady. And he puts the censer in its place. Why are some of these in a low voice? You know, and even in saying in a low voice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so this is while he's actually walking around. So this is a little confusing because we don't actually see this. Yeah. Why don't we actually see this? Because yeah. because in the Greek tradition we have orthros directly before a liturgy, right. which is not always it's not strictly required. You yeah. can just have liturgy by itself. But because we almost always have orthros first. He's just finished the sensing at Most Holy Theodore, Mother of the Light. He just finished doing this exact sensing. He's come back in, recovering the gifts. So it's only been three minutes since he just sensed the whole church. So in the Greek tradition, we consider it, okay, you, it's already done. Yeah. So he yeah. just senses the altar. But if you look at the Russian church, which typically doesn't do orthros right before the liturgy, you will see them come out before the liturgy even starts. Right before you'll see the deacon come out and sense the whole church. Mm -hmm. and so why does he say it in a low voice? Because it's um, it's not something that's meant to be heard by the people. It's um, it's you know, practically it wouldn't be possible because he's he's and what what roots is going on? So yeah, yeah he's, out. He's, he's, out. Out. he's got the bells going on the center. Yeah. There. Yeah. So it's a, it's a silent prayer. It's really between you and God. Is it a secret between you and God? I mean, not a secret, but just only between the priest and God? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's whenever it says in a low voice, almost always that means that uh, there's a big debate about mm -hmm. this, but almost always it means that it should be able to be heard by those at the altar, by the clerk. Yeah. Uh, but not by the, the people. Because in our book list, it's always printed. And, you know, you try, I try to keep up with it. But right. by the time I try to keep up with it, y'all have already done it and gone to the loud voice. Yeah. 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 Because it's beautiful. Well, same yeah, it's both, both prayers are yeah. just astounding. They're astounding, yeah. And yeah. there's so many. Yeah, yeah same bases in particular. Yeah. They really are. Yeah, they, I mean, obviously, it's only in the last couple hundred years that people could have a book of the Divine Literature. <laughs> so for most of the history of the church, the only people who had the book were the priests. Um, so these prayers were mysterious. You know, they did. That's you what we would call the it's, it's actually just in the last uh, 10 years, the Synod in Greece gave the blessing for the priest to, if you choose, you can do it out loud. Um, you know, so it was, it's been really hotly debated for the last hundred years. Uh, you know, so now they said, you know, it's up to the discretion of the, the priest or that local bishop on whether or not. So our bishop has said, no, yeah. don't do it. And don't but do somewhere, it. I don't remember when I was young, way young, we were with Tom Shirt and all that. I can remember that when the low voice, the altar boys were sent out and it was just meant for the papadis to mm -hmm. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were sent out several times during the service? Yeah, yeah. Huh. We were put to the side, you know, mm -hmm. not necessarily come through the doors, just right. put to the side, then come back in. In mm -hmm. and then out, mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it could be too like the the if you guys are being loud and rowdy <laughs> and you get out the door on the street. I have a sensing question. Yeah. Sensing is very methodical. Yeah. And I notice with her husband and Andre's mom, there's a great deal of sensing of the dead of the of the body. Yeah. Is that what is it symbolic? Why are you doing that? Yeah. Well, each human being is a, is a, in the image and likeness of God, so it's an icon. <laughs> so we would we sense it like it's an icon. What, uh, what else could we say? I mean, there may be a practical aspect as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, because you have smells, um, especially in the ancient world, you didn't have big you know, refrigerators that you could keep people in. So. 
We were always said, my mother used to tell us it was for the psyche to help the yeah. psyche rise and go and move forward. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's just symbolized the, in the prayers, mm -hmm. prayers being offered for that person. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Uh, well, I, I mean, I was, I was just <laughs> noticing that, uh, uh, you know, it's it's kind of interesting with uh, the sacraments. And I, I consider the burial of the sacrament, you know, it's not part of that traditional seven, but like St. Dionysius referred to it as, as a sacrament of the church. Um, in the case of the, the sacraments, uh, uh, in a sense, each sacrament has its specific altar, right? So like in the, the during the Eucharist, the holy table, the altar is used. But if you, if you look at uh, like a baptism, it's the, the priest treats the, the baptismal font. font as the altar. Exactly. So like when he does the well, Yemeni, he'll bless over the baptismal font. He'll stand in front of the baptismal font. He'll sense around it just the way that he does during the, the altar and the liturgy. Um, and you see something similar with, with a, a wedding and the table on the Salea. And uh, I hadn't really noticed it uh, until I attended funerals at the, the Russian church that it, the body almost becomes the altar. So the, pe the priests actually stand to the sides yeah. uh, facing the, the body instead of being in the altar, they, they come out. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. I think that did stand out under his mom because we yeah. were all. So like even, even the way that like the main celebrant is facing east right. towards the body. And then even the way the priests arrange themselves on the side is the same way that we would have done in the altar or the baptismal font or, you know. Mm. The entire church was sent. It is a very ancient practice to sense the holy altar, the sanctuary, and the entire church before the beginning of the celebration of a sacrament or some other service. This is also done before the divine liturgy. According to St. Simeon of Thessaloniki, the celebrant first senses the holy prophecies of the holy table in the form of a cross, and then the entire sanctuary. In this way, he indicates that the transmission of God's gifts begins from within the holy sanctuary. And from there passes to the rest of the church. Some celebrants also sense the entire church and the people. This is also referred to by St. Dionysius, who says that before the divine liturgy, the whole church is sensed, starting and finishing with the holy altar. For God is the beginning and end of good things, and the altar is God's throne and his place. By sensing in this manner, the celebrant indicates the grace, gift, and fragrance of the Holy Spirit, which is poured out upon the world in heaven through Jesus Christ, and which through Christ has ascended again to heaven. The Tripadia, the hymns recited by the celebrant as he senses, refer to the resurrection of Christ, the mystery that we experience in every liturgy. The first Tripadia, in particular, brings us into liturgical space and time. Christ, who is with us, is the uncircumscribed God who fills all things. For this reason, the space of the divine liturgy is infinite, and its time is eternity. It is into this space and time we are welcomed when the celebrant senses us. The sensing at this point recalls the custom among Eastern peoples of receiving their guests by anointing their heads with fragrant oil. Christ, through the celebrant, receives us into his house where we are invited to the Eucharistic supper. So I don't know if you've ever seen it like in the villages in Greece, <laughs> they still have this custom, especially on big feast days, maybe even sometimes Sundays too, and on feast days, they'll take the, 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 the sprinkler, the baptisterium, uh, and fill it with rose water or perfumed water. And, and usually like when they go around and pass the basket uh, for donations, the someone will follow along and bless the, the head with the rose water. It's from this ancient tradition. And then sometimes people will go like this, to get some in their hands and all. You know, like this. It's considered like a, a blessing, but it's a, it's a way of welcoming, especially in those feasts where, um, like if it's your church's feast day mm -hmm. and you are you know that you're welcoming people from elsewhere, that's definitely when they would do something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when y'all sprinkle us with holy water, yeah. if I don't get in, any on me, I feel cheated. <laughs> and you ought to feel the push and the rose for people to yeah. get there. Yeah. Is that why you guys did that to Andre's mom? Because I've never seen that before. We all were all that's blessed and right water. Thing. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Was that the same concept or? I don't know. That's just a Russian. Because they didn't do the dirt and stuff on the chest like we did, did they? Did they? At least not 
least not that I saw. Yeah, at the cemetery. They, we did at the cemetery on the cast. Which is the cast? Uh, yeah, but not on the body. The road is just a little different traditions. Yeah. Not like it used to be. We sent us all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna get hit one way or the other. In 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 the Ethiopian tradition, if if uh, like if the if the Ethiopian family invites you to their home, mm -hmm. they'll usually uh, like right before you come in, they'll start burning frankincense. They'll start burning. They'll, they'll light incense as as this uh, honor. That's the Apolotikian. Apolotikian is another uh, hymn. As the Apolotikian of Madness is being sung. The deacon holds up his orari and bows his head to the priest, saying, It is time for the Lord to act. Holy Master, give the blessing. The priest places his right hand on the deacon's head, saying, Blessed is our God, always and on and ever, unto ages of ages. Amen. Deacon, Amen. Pray for me, Holy Master. Priest, may the Lord direct your steps into every good work. Remember me, Holy Master. May the Lord God remember you in his kingdom, always and on and ever, unto ages of ages. Amen. The priest bows three times and says in a humble voice, Glory to God in the highest, so on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Yeah. Is that when the deacon's next to you and you're blessing him? Yeah, right this before you talk steps. Yeah, so he kneels, mm -hmm. uh, the priest blesses him, he goes off, uh, and then the priest, the priest, singular or priests, plural, <laughs> bow three times, glory to God in the highest, so on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And then say twice, Lord, you open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise, but claim your praise. Lord, Lord, open to us the door of your mercy. So they began the divine living. So that I, my right earlier word. discussion was it is time for the Lord to act. Yeah. What, which word? Get up. Get up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what Kieros means. It means a time that something's supposed to happen. <laughs> but not it's not referencing the forward backward concept of Keros. Yeah, it is yeah, it's not chronos. It's no, but I mean it isn't Keros forwards and backwards and present all at the same time. So I guess you could say that. Yeah. Keros also means like season. Yeah. Like there's something in that time or to that time. This is, this is like if you think of in kind of the agricultural society, you know, the spring wasn't just like when flowers bloom. That was the season that the grain was planted. Right? There's there's a, a purpose entwined or or woven into that time. It's the time when yeah, when certain things are supposed to happen. It's. Uh, I thought there was a, a concept you, in the liturgy. You thank God for the second glory is coming, but hasn't right. happened. I thought Carol sort of pull that into the, into the present and pull Holy Thursday into the present. That's what happens. In, that's what the divine liturgy happens. What he's saying here that you know, is into the space and time. In other words, space of the divine liturgy is infinity and it's time is eternity. So, so once is when it's time, Carol, for the liturgy, uh, we enter into the liturgy and it's within the liturgy that time. When you do the prayer for the deacon, is that not also a prayer for the congregation, for the catechumens, for the rest of us that are deacons within the church as participants? It's not, it's, is it just a prayer for the deacon? There are other prayers. There are other prayers. That would bring in the congregation. Yeah, this one's just for the deacon. When, while we are preparing to begin the divine liturgy, Christ's time, Eros, is drawing near. The deacon reminds us of this when he addresses the celebrant and says, It is time for the Lord to act. It is time to yield our place to the Lord so that he himself may become the celebrant of the service of our offering and accept it, and through it that he may be given to us. When it was suggested to Christ that he should go up to the Feast of Tabernacles, he answered, My time has not yet fully come. His time, meaning the moment of the cross and death, this is the time in which we live during the divine liturgy. Christ's time, his keros, is also his glory which is to come, of which the Jewish feasts were the type and prefiguration. Thus Christ says, I am not coming to this Jewish feast 
because nothing in it delights me. I am waiting instead for the time of the true festival, which has not yet come. Then, when my time comes, I shall be with my disciples, rejoicing in the radiance of the saints, and I will shine with supreme brightness in the glory of the Father. The divine liturgy prefigures this time of the kingdom of God, which is to come. May the Lord direct your steps into every good work, says the priest to the deacon. The supreme good work is the divine liturgy, through which God, the principal good, works our salvation. God told us, or Christ told us, my father is still work, is working still, and I am working. Through the liturgy, God continues his work of creation. He recreates man and the world. The divine liturgy is the Lord's work, his act. It is time for the Lord to act. All right, now we're finally getting, we'll just go a little bit into the, the divine liturgy properly. Well, Lord our God, take away the veils of hidden meaning which shroud the sacred rite. Reveal it to us in shining clarity and flood our spiritual eyes with your infinite light. So that's from the liturgy of St. James, which is typically only done once, perhaps twice a year. <clears throat> What's the other time besides this feast day? Uh, the Sunday after yes. Christmas. All right. <clears throat> is it ever done in this country where you receive like a priest? I'm sure so, so so when when we when when uh Father Calibus was the professor of liturgics and we would do the, the liturgy of St. James and the feast of St. James, uh he did it that way. Was it the full by three and a half hour liturgy? Is it long, long, isn't it? Yeah, it's 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 basically as long as we're throwing some liturgy together. Um it kind of depends on the, the pace of the, the prayers. But uh uh when when uh, Father Zemaris came, he was like, "No, no I don't trust people to hold it." Um, yeah. And so, so he he went to so we, and and so when when I've done it here, I've always just done the yeah. the, the chalice. Yeah, I think that's the that's the norm. Right? Yeah, even even so, like uh, when I was for the game and I was first going to do it. You know, I had the notes from school, but. I, I found like half a dozen videos of bishops and priests doing it in Greece, and every single one of them yeah. was with this. In Greece, it's not not done. I think it's the, the received tradition of, of the way to do it now is is to distribute it in the normal way. But some converts who read about what happened 1800 <laughs> years ago, they, they want to idealize it. Oh, let's do it that way again. Yeah, well, okay, forward. yeah, that's how it was done then, but that's not the receipt. I would not want to receive it. I'd be scared to death. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the the, the, the uh, start scared to death of people receiving. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's my father's marriage. That, <laughs> I mean, and that was that was like ninety nine percent seminarians too. That right. were eventually going to be priests. Because right? oh, yeah. you're you're you know at least the priest is leaning over the altar and the you know when he does it. Um, but in the case of the, the liturgy of St. James, and the reason why, you know, you know, some bishops give a blessing for priests to do it is uh, it's not a, uh, it, it has had a continuous tradition of use in Jerusalem. And so there's that, that living tradition of doing the liturgy. And in the case of Jerusalem, it was always with the spoon. Uh, but as as some people were saying, okay, it's a it's a lit tradition. It's always been done in the Orthodox Church. You know, let's do it here and there. Some people, like Father said, you know, maybe converts or you know, like my beloved professor, uh, kind of liturgical archaeologist, I don't know how to put it, um, wanted to bring back some of these other facets of it. But again, you know, there, there's there's pretty pretty good good evidence that that. At least by the fifth century, uh, probably very from place to place, uh, they were already using the spoon or tongs. And I think by the the ninth, tenth century, it was like universal. I don't think anyone. I mean, it. usually those kind of things you can trace to the legalization of Christianity in the fourth century. So, you know, when when you were facing death on a daily basis for being Christian. Doing a pretty good bet that if you're receiving the body in your hands, you're going to be pretty careful with it because you're taking your faith pretty seriously. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a hundred years later, when ninety nine percent of the Roman Empire is suddenly Christian, you might not assume that about every Christian. You know, <laughs> so yeah, that's probably when the change happened. By, by the time of Saint John Chrysostom, I, I just I just heard this recently and got the biggest kick out of it. Uh, and one of his sermons. 
uh, he, uh, he was basically saying to the people, he said uh, uh, that the people, their very liturgy uh, could tell him the name of who won the races in the stadium the day before, but probably couldn't name two names of the 12 apostles. Yeah, <laughs> things have not changed much. Yeah, yeah, and I was, I was thinking the same thing. I was like, I bet you they could tell me every single SEC you know, football game. <laughs> the, the, the 12 apostles. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Yeah. That's probably. Yeah. Yeah. And St. James Liturgy is the oldest, correct? Uh, maybe. Maybe. I've heard some scholars say weeks following the Pentecost, at least the body of it. So they, they, yeah. So usually, usually it's, it's, uh, uh, it, I mean, it's historically in Jerusalem been attributed to St. James. And there may be some parts of it, like like so, even like the liturgy of Saint John Chrysostom, the liturgy of Saint Basil, it's really just the anaphora, that central prayer that that bishop would say. Um, so it may be one of those kind of that that same. Thing. That's what I've heard. Of. Yeah. So the yeah. So yeah, there are probably pieces of it then. Yeah. So the, like like only begotten, you know, the hymn that we sing at the the beginning. That's yeah. present in all three liturgies. That was uh, Emperor Justinian right. that put that in. So that's what, 6th century? 6th century, yeah. <clears throat> and that was... It's so we, so we wait, so we wait to start the next year? Yeah, yeah. yeah, this right. is the end of the year. Let's wait. So we've done everything leading up to the liturgy, which actually I think some of the most interesting stuff is and the stuff that people don't know, all the services that take place before the liturgy even starts. Well, it would be interesting to go through a study of uh, Orthros sometime, too, because Orthros is probably one of the most complex services we have, and there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff packed in there. You got the Psalms in there that, based on the temple services, the Psalms form like the backbone of the entire service. Uh, and that's really the meat of whatever saint or feast you're celebrating is packed into Orthros. It's the tension. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you're saying it's not necessary? No, I'm not saying it. Well, it's not, yes, it's not strictly necessary. I mean, you can just do the Divine Liturgy without Orthros, or you can do the Orthros separate from the Divine Liturgy. You could do it like the Russians do it as a vigil the night before. As they do Vespers and Orthros in the evening. In the monasteries on Mount Athos, they might they differ, but some of them might do Orthros at one in the morning, and then go, go one to four, and then go rest from four to six, and then start energy at six. I mean, mm -hmm. so there's not, and sometimes you can just skip it all together because the divine, the Orthros is part of the daily cycle of services. The liturgy is not part of the daily cycle of services. It's something completely different. So they're not really attached per se, you know. Mm -hmm. You can insert the divine liturgy almost any day except during Lent. Uh, yeah. study of that, so, I mean, Helgi and I were <laughs> she wasn't she was in my class. We were fascinated by the I think we talked about this, the six psalms. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to move, you're not supposed to cross yourself because those are the psalms that are going to be said at your judgment. Yes, so we they told, did say that the too. six psalms, the very beginning of Orthros. Uh -huh. You're not supposed to move, you're supposed to stand as still as you can. There's a couple of Opportunities in there to cross yourself. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to because you're blessing yourself. Yeah. You're basically rehearsing for judgment because those psalms are going to be read as your judgment. Oh. Before Christ. Which ones are they? Yeah. I forget. Yeah. If you just look at the internet, the six psalms of Orthodox, it will show them. Mm -hmm. So it's really made me pay attention when we're doing them because we think about if those are going to be recited. At your judgment. I mean, is that accurate? Yeah. Uh, uh, I didn't recall hearing you. So, so, so I, I was, I, the monks at Goody, one of the monks at Goody Goody told me that. Uh, oh, yeah. Because some young, zealous monk yelled at me in front of the other monks for sitting down during six songs because that's when you usually sit down. And uh, the older monk told me, uh, uh, Father Simon told me that uh, there's this tradition. And some people say it's because in the six songs, everything that were to be judged by some people say the length of time of reading the six psalms is how I I have 
neither in church fathers and any liturgical father who still may know better, but it, it, it seems to me to be one of those kind of Lower maybe two. like uh, like a tradition of the people, uh, yeah. kind of similar as people kind of you know attribute symbolism to these different things. Mm -hmm. But I, I other other than you know that specific monastery and that monk, I had I had heard that before. It says um, here it is one of the most sacred parts of the Orthros service. During these readings, we should abandon all thoughts, stand quietly, and pay attention. What are you doing now? I just do all the um, six songs. So so I don't believe anything. Kind of and and so where did different. you get that from, Hal? I just Google the six songs of Orthos. And so well, you know, the internet isn't the internet isn't always right, you know. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Are you serious? I didn't know that. <laughs> So sometimes you'll have a problem that if you show up a few minutes late for church, actually this happened to me when I was at St. Vladimir a few weeks ago, I was a few minutes late uh, for Orthros, and you couldn't get in because everyone who's late has to wait in the back of the church. So after the six songs. So after the six songs, then you can move in and find your seat. You don't just go in and find a seat while the six songs are being read. So that's... You say, now that's going to give a whole new meaning when I hear them now. Yeah. And then we don't even make the sign of the cross. Right, right? you don't. So even when in the middle of the, after the first three, it says, glory to the Father and the Son, you're not supposed to make your cross sign because it's just supposed to be still. Are these the first yeah. six psalms of Orthos? Correct. Yeah, there's a yeah. six, the, it's called the six psalms of Orthos. It's 337, 62, 87, 102, and 142. I, I never make it to the beginning of Orthos. The Greek exalts on most exalts, so it's not really six psalms, it's six psalms. It's the singular, it's the six song. Well, yeah, but that's just the is that called the unit? Yeah, it's a unit. But isn't that traditionally why, why in, in Greece the entire six psalm is just read by one one charger? Yeah, yeah, that's true. But, but then you know, we also say surround the little ball, so yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. Like during the Lenten services, we traditionally sit down when they're reading the Psalms. Okay. Oh, like during Holy Week. During Holy Week. Well, that's the priest saints because there's a bunch of Psalms. We always yeah. we always sit down when they're so reading they, the Psalms. Yeah, priest saints, but it's not six Psalms. No, but I'm, I'm asking. That's right. right. a question. When when they read the Psalms, we usually sit down. Mm -hmm. Psalm fifty, it's, it's high time to sit down. Yeah. So. Doing orthos and stuff, we're not supposed to sit down when they're reading the songs. Technically, yeah. Technically, well, you the know what you and you'll never let us sit down. You know what you need to do? And I got the bell. Bring it one time when we can sit down and stand up. Yeah. I, I say we just get rid of the pews and then it's like, I'm with you. You get you get you get used to it after yeah. Yeah. Think about this parish rarely sits anyway. We stand up more than a lot. Yeah, there. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's. I always I was telling my friends in the military that the Orthodox Church and the Marines. One thing they have in common: if it's bad for your souls, it's good for your soul. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's pretty good. So you've not heard it before the six songs of judgment, etc. Okay. And I'd only heard it that one. Specific. That was Gabriel Kermes. I don't know where he's at. Father Kermin's son. He's uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. I mean, what jurisdiction? Greek. Greek. Well, I don't know. But he's, he studied a little bit in Greece. And he probably picked it up there. And I don't think anybody would actually know which psalms are going to be read during our judgment. Yeah. We? I mean, it's... I don't know. It's it's really like about six people here for the six. I agree with Father Mike. It sounds like a small tea tradition. That's, I mean, there's nothing sounds wrong about it, but... I wouldn't say that it's a dogma of the church. And whether you do your stabro or not, it's not going to send you to hell <laughs> yeah. if you do your stabro. You know? Someone someone wrote a, a letter to St. Barsanufius, who was a, a fifth century desert father. And we have collections of his writings. People would send letters from all over the Roman world. And uh, he and this other monk, John, would respond. And it's really neat because it's one of the few cases where you actually have lay people sending letters to a great saint of the father. So it's not just monastic letters. And uh, 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 he always has like, a lot of times they're almost humorous responses. 
And um, so like a deacon, I think, sends a letter and says, you know, uh, you know, should I correct people if they cross themselves with their left hand instead of their right hand? Mm -hmm. And St. Barsanufius or John, I don't remember which one responded to this, and said, why would you stop someone from making the sign of the cross? He says, besides, how am I supposed to cross my right hand if not with my left hand? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Nice. That's the orthodox from. Yeah, yeah. All right. Let's thank you, Greg.